Good evening. We are truly glad that you are here tonight and hope that you will once again enjoy our program. I have been thinking about something. Uh, the last two weeks we were here and we will be here for two weeks more. But have you ever started considering what you did before? And what will you do after we're done? <laughs> but while we are still here, let's not worry about that, because we have something good to do. Welcome. We are going to ask uh, Kathleen and Nancy again tonight to lead us in our song service. Thank you so much. Welcome, everyone. Welcome. Good to see everyone here. Thank you so much for being here. We will sing because we're very optimistic. There is sunshine <laughs> in my soul today. Now please stand as we sing our theme song. There's victory in Jesus.
Amen. Yes. Amen. Thank, Thank you. you so much, ladies. You may be seated. And it's my privilege to tell you that we once again this evening have somebody else than Ella to bring us uh, our special music for tonight. We've heard him once before. Henshi, thank you for being here tonight and uh, blessing us with your time. God bless you as you do this. Thank you. Savior, hear my humble cry. While on others' downward calling, to let pass me. Trusting only in thy merit, would I seek thy face? Heal my wounded, broken spirit, save me by thy grace. Save That was beautiful, thank you. And just because it was so nice, 
you will be up again. <laughs> Let's just uh, talk about a few things that you need to remember. And that is if you will be here for Friday, Saturday, and Sunday evening, the weekend, there is a special book called The Ministry of Healing, talking about the best way we can live to have the best life. So there is this book if you will attend the three nights of the weekend. And if you fill out all your quizzes and hand them in, you can get this book, The Final Empire, asking, will America collapse uh, at the end of our series? So, uh, see, I have enough, and there's more. If you do your quizzes and hand them in, you can get a copy of this book at the end of our series. Talking about quizzes, have you done your quiz for last night? What was our topic again? The object of the Antichrist attack, which was law versus grace. So let's go through the quiz questions and see how you did. When did the U.S. Supreme Court rule against displaying the Ten Commandments on or in U.S. schools? 1980. 1980, yes. That was so easy. I gave you the answer right away and told you this is a quiz answer. All you had to do was remember 1980 and put it on your quiz sheet. Good for those who did that. The dragon is enraged against the woman and her remnant. What are the two things that identify the remnant? What do they do? They yes, that's number one. They have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Yes. How often does Jesus change his mind and even change his laws? Never. Why not? Because he's the same when? Yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Ah, I'm, I'm thinking your teacher is getting better. <laughs> no, it's just your good memories. That's wonderful. What is the summary of the Ten Commandments and how are they new in the New Testament? Yes. Summary first. L Ooh. Love your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with everything you've got. And what is the second commandment that is equal to this? Love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said he's giving us a new commandment, but John says it's a commandment of the Old Testament, and we've actually read where it came from in the Old Testament. Why did Jesus say it's new? It was a renewal in their own minds because they've forgotten it. And they were living for themselves only. And if I could downplay somebody else, I could be king of the heap. Okay. Uh, question number five. Did Jesus abolish the Ten Commandments 
or is it still valid today? And why do you say that? Whatever you said. So let's ask, is the Ten Commandments over and done with? Is it gone? No. Why do you say so? They are a part of the characters of God, and He does not change, so it's not changed, and it's also still there because the Bible says in the New Testament, you need to do this, you need to do that, you need to show, can we murder today? We cannot even say, Raka, or I hate you. We can't say that because that, Jesus said, would be a transgression of the law. And Jesus himself said, not a dot or a stroke of a T will change about the law. So what is it still available? Is it still binding today? For sure. Wow. I hope you did well on your quiz and that you are returning them so that we can give you one of our books. And remember, if you did not have the opportunity of being here or you want to share a message, you can always acquire one of our DVDs at the table in the foyer. And remember the astonishing price. It's so, it's so expensive. It's only $2. Uh, so if you need one of those, you are more than welcome to get them. OK, let's uh, think. Is there anything else I need to do? I think I got them. <gasps> How can I even forget? We have a few number nines for tonight. Uh, who needs? Oh, there are two, three. There you are. She needs one more. Uh, we checked. I think we did. OK, let me get the box. And. There you go. Thank you. Oops. Wow, I'm fast. <laughs> Anybody else? Well, then you then you get one. Uh, I think you need two more. Hmm? Yeah, just two. So in two nights, we'll, we'll get you. And now I think I've got you all. Oh, good. I have some left. Remember, when you hit number nine, you can get uh, a copy of uh, the three, three ring binder. Thank you. And then you can put all your material right in there and it'll keep it safe and it will be neat and tidy. Good to have you here. And we pray that God will bless us as we meet around his word tonight. Let's do that. Father in heaven, we thank you for allowing us this evening to meet around your word. I pray that you will bless us and Lord, that you will help us to understand more clearly how you can change our lives, being the greatest of all miracles. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Then the dragon was enraged at the woman and went off to make war against the rest of her offspring, those who obey God's commandments and hold to the testimony of Jesus. 
Revelation 12, 17. And by the way, you've already just heard, I think, the answer to the first quiz question for tomorrow. No, for Friday evening. Because tomorrow is going to be a free night. But notice the two points of attack of the devil are God's commandments and then the testimony of Jesus and those who hold to that testimony. And I saw a beast coming out of the sea. The dragon gave this beast its power and his throne and great authority. And men worshipped the dragon because he had given authority to the beast. And they also worshipped the beast. If you do the one, you are inevitably also worshipping the other. How many people would come and worship the beast and therefore also worship the dragon. Then I saw another beast, the false prophet, as we will notice from Revelation 19 verse 20, coming out of the earth, and he made the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast. And he performed great and miraculous signs because of the signs he was given power to do on behalf of the first beast. He deceived the inhabitants of the earth. So what do we do here at Revelation today if we want to understand what we read in Scripture? Yes, we compare Scripture with Scripture. And when we do that, we discover that the second beast who comes out of the earth is actually the false prophet. Revelation 19.20 But the beast was captured, and with him the false prophet, who had performed the miraculous signs on his behalf. With these signs, he had deluded those who had received the mark of the beast and worshipped his image. Can you see how the false prophet, this second beast, conspires with the first beast? and how they deceive the world into worshipping the first beast. And this first beast got its authority from where? From the dragon. The second beast somehow uses miracles to attack those who keep God's commandments and have the testimony of Jesus or the faith of Jesus Christ. Now we've already seen how it is imperative for us to understand that as long as the false prophet works miracles to deceive people into worshipping the beast and therefore also worshipping the dragon, miracles alone cannot be proof that God is at work. You are with me on that. Miracles are not the only proof that God is at work before, because the false prophet uses miracles to help the world serve and worship the beast. And also, therefore, worship the dragon. Who's the dragon again? So, at the end of it all, both the first and the second beast is trying to bring the world, worshipping the devil. 
And it says, the whole world went after and served the dragon. Many, though, does not quite realize that that is who they are serving, who they are worshiping. Now, this is especially too true when the miracles tend to undermine the obedience of God's people when it comes to God's law. Jesus made the same point, and he says, Not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom, but only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. Jesus is speaking of people who were outwardly very religious people. They were even, it was even possible for them to perform miracles. They think they have eternal life. But sadly, the fact is, Jesus says, even though you have done these things and you have called it up under my name, I never knew you. What does that mean? That they were deceived. And they did things in the name of Jesus. But unfortunately, it was never he who gave them the authority or the know-how to do it. The test, according to Jesus, is not that miracles are performed, but the test, according to Jesus, is that they will do the will of my Father in heaven. Evidently, even Satan, the old dragon, can do what? Perform miracles. And let me tell you tonight that Jesus is not interested in mere lip service. Anyone can say, Lord, Lord, but only those who demonstrate that Jesus is the Lord of their lives by obeying the Father will be saved. The question for us now becomes, how can I know that I have a place reserved for me in that bright city where Jesus has gone to prepare places for his beloved people. Revelation chapter 13 verse 8 says, All inhabitants of the earth will worship the beast. All whose names were not written in the book of life belonging to the Lamb. I think the real question here is, how can I know that my name is written in the book? In order to, to understand how we can know that we have eternal life, we must, must ask a question. On what basis or on what condition does God give eternal life in heaven to anybody? I know from experience that the most common answer to this question usually is something like this. I, mean, I must believe in Jesus and live a good life. Sounds logical. And you could never be sure unless you become perfect. 
And even then, what about the sins of the, the past that I have committed? You see, there is no hope of earning or obtaining eternal life on the basis of how good I am, how good you are. That's why the Bible says that we are saved by grace, through faith, and not by anything that we have done for ourselves. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9 says, For it is by grace that you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourself. It is a gift from God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Remember that I have quoted this verse, and it is in your material, because there is a question for you to complete the verse. Oh, I'm so good at giving you the questions. Crip notes. It is a free gift. That's the way it has to be because Romans chapter 3, 23 says, we are all sinners. What is it when we do sin? Sin is the breaking of God's law. And we have all broken the law. And therefore, we deserve what we get for breaking the law. What is the payment for breaking the law? What do we deserve for breaking the law? Death. Yes. We are all sinners and we are doomed to die no matter how obedient to God we might be or become. Fortunately, thank God, this is not the end of the story because God is a God of love. He is merciful. He does not want to destroy anyone. I don't know whether you looked at my tie tonight. This is a message that I want to share with the world. It is a sharing of the oldest, most well-known verse of Scripture in all the world. There's just about no language in which it does not exist. What does it say? For God so loved the world, that he gave his only son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. God wants every one of us to be saved because he's a God of love. But God is also a God that is just. And therefore, he eventually will destroy sin. God cannot allow sinners to forever cause suffering and pain for those who want to serve him. He must put an end to it all. But how can he destroy sinners and save those who want to serve him? For they too have sinned. And for this purpose, or this process, poses a, a kind of a dilemma to God. He wants to save us all. But how can he now save those who sinned and at the same time still be telling the truth when he says that if you sin, you'll die. It is as if Satan comes and challenges God 
You said, if you sin, you'll die. They sinned. You can't save them. But oh, mercy. Here is where Jesus steps onto the stage. Here is where Jesus comes in and God gave His Son, Jesus Christ, to live in this world on our behalf and die on a cross on our behalf so that He can, after He was risen, save each one that wants to say, that wants to, to follow and serve God. In Romans 3.25 we read, God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of His blood to be received by faith. He did this to demonstrate His righteousness because in His forbearance He had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to de demonstrate His righteousness at the present time so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Christ. In Jesus, because He stepped into our place, we can be justified by and through and in front of God if we have faith in Jesus. So first of all, it is very important that we understand who Jesus is. We must realize that when Christ died for us, it was the infinite God accepting our punishment for our sins into His own life. Was He really God? Could He do that? Could He step into my place and die for my sins? In the beginning was the Word. And the Word, who is the Word? Jesus. And the Word was God. No question about it. And I want you to notice that it does not say that He was a God. He wasn't one of many. He was God. And the Word was God. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Isn't that the best news out? That Jesus stepped out of heaven into this sinful world. A Savior to each one that was a sinner. Isaiah said, prophesying about the Messiah that would come, and he says, and his name shall be called Wonderful, the Mighty God, the Prince of Peace. But look at that middle one there, the Mighty God. And when we realize that the one who came to this world was God and was willing to bear our punishment and purchase for us eternal life, surely we can see how much God really loved us. But the devil the old snake, serpent, is still not quite satisfied. But they have sinned, not Jesus. Jesus can take their place. God had an answer that mortal minds cannot fully comprehend. We must understand what really happened on the cross, as far as we possibly can. It was so much more than just Christ dying on the cross 
for us. The Bible says God put all the punishment of our sins on His Son. The Lord has laid on Him the iniquity of us all. He Himself bore our sins in His body on the tree. And here, Peter is quoting the Old Testament, specifically Isaiah 53, verse 6. And here is what that said. Once again, a prophecy about the Messiah that was going to come. And it says, we all, like sheep, hello, that's us, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. One of the most astounding verses of Scripture comes and says, And for our sake, God made Christ to be sin for us when He had never sinned, so that in Him we might become the righteousness of God. That, my friends, that is the miracle. The greatest miracle of all times. That God could take our guilt and place it on Jesus. And He died on our behalf. And now we can live in His freedom, in His righteousness. He actually became guilty, even though he had no part in committing any of the many things that we have done wrong. Jesus was as guilty as though he had done them himself, while I actually did them. And even though he did not sin, he felt the shame he felt the guilt and the dirty th feelings that we experience when we do the wrong things. Multiplied by every person that ever lived on this planet. And when he hung on that cross with your and my guilt, Pressing on him, it became more than he could bear, and it crushed his life. Yes, that is really why Jesus died, not because of the nails in his hands or the crown of thorns on his head, but because of our, your, mine, and the world's sin. And because of that, we can know without a shadow of a doubt that in Him we have become the righteousness of God. That's perfect. And we stand perfect in Him. And every sin we have ever committed in the past, every sin we are committing now, and every sin ever that we will commit in the future is forgiven, is removed, and we stand before guiltless, before Him guiltless, as though we have never sinned as long as we remain in Him. And that isn't The last half of the verse says, In Him we might become, become the righteousness of God. In other words, God gives us the perfect righteousness, the perfect obedience of 
Christ. He takes our guilt so that the price is paid in full and then He gives us the perfect obedience of Jesus Christ. And that is what enables God to save us. That is why we can never be good enough for God to save us. It takes the infinite righteousness of the perfect, obedient Son of God. Put on our account, covering whatever we have done, and then saves us. You see, Jesus wants to give us life. We must what, was, what must we do to receive that life? Simple, or the answer is rather simple. Plainly stated, we must receive Christ as our Savior and Lord. He who has the Son, John says, has life. John also says, in 1 John 5, 13 through 15, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. Do you know that you have eternal life? I hope you do because John says he wrote down some stuff so that we can know that we have eternal life. This is the confidence we have in approaching God, that if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us, and we know that we have what we ask Him for. So what do we need, what do we need to do to receive eternal life? To know that we have something better than this old world waiting on us. We simply need to ask God for Jesus to come into our lives. And accept by faith that He did that. And that's why Paul said, we are saved by grace through faith. And all this means is that we must ask Jesus to come into our lives and believe that He really is there. That is faith that will change our lives, that will change our destiny. How can we be sure? Only because He promised that He would come into our lives. And if He promises something, will He do it? Oh, believe me for sure. If He has promised, He will do it. He says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock, and if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him. What does it say here? Read it again. I might come in to him. Oh, there's a possibility that I might come in to him. This is not what Jesus says. This is not what the verse says. He says, if you open the door, I will come in. Jesus assured us that if we ask, He will step into our lives and change it for the better. We don't have to wait for some miraculous gift or an exhilarating feeling. We don't have to wait until our daily lives reach some acceptable level of performance before we have assurance of eternal life. 
we can know for certain that we have eternal life and that we have been saved because he told us in his word that he would give it to us if we ask. Our assurance is based on his promise. Can you see why the beast wants to shift our focus from the perfect completed work that Jesus did and wants to give us to a dependence on what happens to us by way of miracles? and our own performance. If we look to these things, we can never be certain of our acceptance with God. Because some mornings we get up and get out of bed with the wrong foot. And everything for the day is messed up. Have you experienced that? Oh, my, yes, almost happened to me this morning. But it's not on how well I perform that makes me acceptable to God. It is because Jesus performed on my behalf and died in my stead, was raised in my place, and therefore I can live life to its full. If we look to the things we can never, uh, to these kind of things that we put into practice, we can never be certain of our acceptance with God. But when we in faith accept what Jesus has done on our behalf, do I have to wonder? Do I have to take a second chance, uh, uh, give it a, a second thought? No, because he says, if you have accepted me, I will give you eternal life. But there is a second point of attack through which the old dragon comes to us. Remember, Satan attacks not only those who have faith in Jesus Christ, but also those who obey his commands. Asking Jesus into your life is more than just saying the words, Jesus, come into my life. We need to recognize that we are sinners and be determined to turn away from from sin. That is what we call repentance. Jesus is not only our Savior, but He wants to be the Lord and Master of our lives. Jesus is Lord, and that means that Jesus should rule in our lives. If we accept Jesus and ask him to come into our lives, we must be willing to also follow him in obedience. In fact, John says, we know that we have come to know him if we obey his commands. The man who says, I know him but does not do what the command uh, do what he commands is a liar and the truth is not in him that is why jesus said if you love me you will obey what i command is it in order to get saved no, it is in because we are saved by allowing him into our lives that we also want to do what he commands so that we can bring honor and glory to his name. Obedience is the test as to whether or not we actually believe 
in God. Oops. When, <laughs> now I have, uh, yeah, there we go. When Eve ate the fruit, she simply demonstrated by her actions that she did not truly believe what God was telling her to do. Anyone can believe in the Savior. Even, the Bible says, the devils know and believe in Jesus. But intellectual belief is not enough. It is belief of the heart that eventually is a saving factor in the lives of people. The kind of belief that reaches out and takes Jesus into the life as Lord that saves us. This doesn't mean, and I want you to hear me clearly, this does not mean that we never sin or that once saved, we are always saved. But even though we may slip and fall and make mistakes in our struggle against sin, we can still be sure that He is there and that He is like a dad or a mom, specifically a mom, when a little baby hurts itself, we are right there to pick him up and say, it's okay, let's try again. Oh, I'm going to tell you a story about that. Not tonight, though, but later on. How we taught our kid, the first one, to walk and what happened while that was happening. But even though we may slip and fall and make mistakes in our struggle against sin, we can still be sure that He is there and that He will pick us up. And as long as we maintain an attitude of repentance and is sorrow for our, sorry for our sins, He'll be there to pick us up to forgive us and let us do it again. Only if we willfully turn against Him, at some point in our life, will He ever let us go. This is the abiding love of God. After we have accepted Him, Jesus assures us that our sins are forgiven. We have become a new person in Jesus. I'm so excited for this next verse. It says, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old has gone, the new is here. We can live, and that is why we have the theme song that we sing every night, a victorious life over enslaving sin and an in eternal life in heaven with Him, soon to be ours forever and ever and ever and even the day after that. Some of the things when we come to Him that held no attraction to us before catches our minds. And things that never caught our attention uh, or, or things that we loved before just loses its uh, splendor. We're a new person. We changed. And that might just be the greatest miracle of all times. That a sinner 
like me can be changed. Now, I know that that is true. I know that God works this kind of miracle because you know what? He changed me. I recall, before I get there, let me tell you about who I am. I was born in a home with parents who professed to be Christians, but who have long before started forgetting about the wonder of His love and His grace for us, swaying before the pre pressures of secular life. Mom was an avid sports girl. She played korfball. It's a game similar to uh, basketball. And she played for the first team of our town and sometimes even was the captain of the team. And she played whenever they played. Mostly they played their games on Sabbaths when we were supposed to be in church, but she preferred to go play some golf ball. Dad, on the other hand, was a workaholic working in a gold mine and often doing double or even 18-hour shifts to care for his little growing family. I recall the visit from Uncle Umpy. Uncle Umpy had just one eye. The other was a glass eye. He scared me to death. But Uncle Ampi was a local elder and came visiting one night from the church that we sporadically, if dad worked night shift and wasn't too tired uh, to do anything else, uh, we might attend and asked my parents, what? are you going to do about your two children and the Christian influence that you are doing, making in their lives? Dad, as I said, the workaholic worked seven out of seven, often 12 or 18 hour shifts. He couldn't see his way clear to change that because his family had needs. Mom couldn't think of not being on the, the korf, korfball ball court. My sister was too young at the stage, and they agreed that Uncle Umpy could come and pick me up every Saturday morning and take me to church. Oh. That was such a thing in my life. But that was where I met Auntie Rose. She was old, very old, maybe already in her 80s, but the one willing to teach Sabbath school for the little ones like me in our church. Looking back, I often wonder if she sometimes must have thought, why did Umpi bring this kid to this Sabbath school? Could have been better without him here because I was a little live wire, just looking for a place to create a spark. Strange how things sometimes never escape your memory. I remember Auntie Rose in the Sabbath school. She knew Jesus and she really wanted to teach the kids in her little class how Jesus loves us and how we can grow up by having changed lives. I also remember 
the curly-haired blonde girl that came to my Sabbath school. Now, we had church or Sabbath school classes in any case in our local church school. Those days, they still wrote with ink pens and you dipped it into a little container that had the ink in. And then you would write and uh, dip and write and dip and write. And one Friday afternoon, the kid in whose bench I would sit forgot to empty his little ink container. I didn't quite know at that tender age how to impress a girl. So instead, I just pestered her. And that Sabbath morning, before Sabbath was when before Sabbath school was over, her beautiful blonde hair had blue tips. As I dipped it into the little ink well on my bench. Poor Auntie Rose. But you know what? Even though she might have thought it would have been better without Peter in her class, she never led on. And while in her class, I started appreciating the Bible. Because the Bible and a knowledge of the Bible actually served a purpose in my life, I loved a good word fight. I would not even dare to call it a um, debate. It was just a dirty, good old Bible fight. You would say something and I would say something back. Quoting from the Bible, just like the Pharisees did, by the way. They knew the Bible well. And yeah, call me what you like. And when I turned 16, my pastor came around and said, don't you think it's a little overdue that you get baptized? And I said, yes. So I got baptized at the age of 16, but not without one kid that always was willing to get into a fight with me too. Coming to my baptism, and as I was preparing to get into the tent, he said, wait, I actually believe what you believe. Can I be baptized too? And that day, call it my first convert, but it was only by the grace of God, he was baptized with me. Now his parents did not appreciate that at all. So they decided to move away and get him out of the influence of this Bible-wheeling kid that was always ready to take him on. While they moved to a different place, his name was Noldus. Noldus got involved with the occult and decided that he would rather serve a different master. He ran away from home and came back to our town and went to live with old friends of the family. Two weeks after they moved he moved in. They went to 
Do you remember those old places that we went to, especially on a Saturday night for entertainment? Uh, Drive-in theater. You remember those? So he went to a drive-in with the family that he was looking, uh, living with. And you know what they saw that night? Any of you know anything about Rosemary's Baby? That was the film they went to see. And after they got home, they asked Nolders to take their three-year-old and put him to bed. Nolders went through the house and instead of delivering him to his bed, he walked through the kitchen, picked up a butcher's knife, went out by the back door and in the garden outside slit the baby's throat and left him by a rose bush. And later on the story which came out and he, he, he told in court that he thought there were so many people that messed up his world and now that he has made a sacrifice, he needed to, to clean the slate. So he got on his bicycle and he rode over to my house because I was one of the ones that messed up his life. It was a Friday evening and almost midnight, when there was a knock on my window, I lived at the back of our house, and I heard, Peter, Peter. I immediately recognized the voice. It was an oldest. And he said, come out. I need to talk to you. Oh, I was so elated. I jumped out of my bed, and as I walked out of my bedroom, I ran into my dad. Now, because of who my dad was, he and who I was, a little spoiled brat, he always allowed me to get my way. But that night, when we met in the, in the corridor, he says to me, where are you going? And I said, Noldus is outside. He wants to speak to me. And he says, totally out of character. You're not going to speak to him. What do you mean? He's my friend. He needs me. He's here. I haven't seen him in months. And he said, you will not speak to him. Go back to your bed. But who I am made me walk behind him to the back door where dad opened the door. He did not invite Naldus in, neither did he allow him to speak to me. And he stood there with his hand behind his back and part of his face covered in blood and we didn't know what was going on. And we thought maybe he was in a fight and now he needed some help. And dad said, be off. Go away. But Noldus stayed longer and wanted to speak to me. God, uh, Dad persisted, not tonight. So eventually Noldus turned around and turned his uh, hand to his front as he walked out of our backyard. And as he was going, he threw something down. We didn't know what it is. And you know, there is a little saying that says, curiosity killed the cat. Both dad and me wondered, what did he throw in our garden? And when he was gone for a few minutes, we both sneaked out. And guess what we got? A butcher's knife. At least a third of the point was covered in dried blood. 
what was going on. Soon enough, the police were there. And all this now had bangles on. <laughs> he was uh, no longer a free boy. And they said they were looking for the knife and told us about the little three-year-old boy that he came to the police station to tell about. And when they got to the house, the little guy was still alive, but barely, and died while they were there. And they were just looking for the knife because they said, Noldus also told them that I was next on his list. And he wanted to kill me as a sacrifice, both as well as one of those that messed up his life. God was good to me. And when I went back to bed that night, maybe I should say early that morning, sleep didn't come. All of a sudden, I started thinking about who I was and what would have happened to me if Noldus completed his assignment, his journey. And in the wee hours of the morning, I slipped out of my bed and invited Jesus into my heart. There were no loud bells. There were no popping balloons. There were no flashing or lightning flashes. There were no singing by angels in front of my window. It was just a peace that is totally unexplainable that came over my life. And that night, not only did I decide that Jesus would be the Lord of my life, I also decided that I would go and work for him in a full-time capacity. I decided to prepare for the ministry and to share the good news about him as far as I could. The devil didn't like me for that. And in my last year in college, on my way back after vacation, having a little VW that my dad bought me, I had an accident and totaled the little car. But none of the three of us in the car had more than a bruised side, uh, a blue egg on the forehead, and some scratches. God spared my life yet again. Two weeks before graduation, me and a little girl that I had at the time went for a swim at the uh, nearest beach to the college. And while we were there, a current started pulling us into the sea. I tried to help her, but I couldn't even help myself. And I was feeling how I was drinking more water than I needed. Almost, almost not making it when a guy on a paddle boat saw my predicament and came and said, just hang on. And once again, God saved my life 
Because you know what? God had a plan for me. As He has plans for each one of us here. And then in my first year of, of ministry as a young intern, I met this girl. She stole my heart the moment I saw her. And when one Friday afternoon in the busy traffic of Hillbrow, the third most densely populated city in the world, I asked her, would you think of marrying me? And you guess, guess what she said? Ah, uh, I have become a very convincing speaker by then. She said, yes. And together we have served the Lord in many places all over. But the story isn't done yet. Day by day, we are still living for Jesus, experiencing His grace, knowing that He is in our lives and that He changed it for the better. Now, just before I end tonight, I have something that I need to tell you. I held a similar set of meetings as this close to where I grew up. My parents were still living there. And you know what? Dad started coming to my meetings. <laughs> and he decided that he too would like to make it more than just lip service. And when it came to baptism, I had the unalterable joy and the privilege to baptize my dad into a life with Jesus. I can't even begin to tell you how much that meant for me. In the meantime, mom has started going back to church too. And she was the organist in our little church where I grew up. They've both gone to rest in Jesus in the meantime. Dad actually died on the same day that is infamous in America, 12, 9-11, hmm, not 12, 9-11. And I'm looking forward to the day when Jesus is going to come again because I am convinced beyond everything else. Because of what they decided to do with their lives, they will be there on the great resurrection morning and together we will share eternity. God made something beautiful out of my life. And my friends, He can do the same for each one of us. Doesn't mean that everything will be roses from here on. Satan makes sure that there are challenges to face. But there is victory in Jesus. You may have never experienced the peace and the happiness that comes from him. Or maybe you have. And praise God for that. Maybe you've drifted away like my parents did. When we are given the opportunity to come back to Him, let's not put it off. Let's not bypass it. 
if you have done this before and you want to renew your commitment to Jesus, if you have not done this before and you want to do it today, I would love to invite you to just bow your heads with me for a moment and pray this prayer. Lord Jesus, I want you to come into my life right now. I'm a sinner. I realize that I cannot save myself. I cannot be good enough to deserve heaven or eternal life. So I put my trust in you. I accept you as my personal savior. I believe you died for me. I receive you as Lord and master over my life. Help me as I turn from my sins and follow you. I accept your gift of eternal life. I don't deserve it, but I thank you for it. And while we have our heads bowed and our eyes closed, if you are doing this for the first time and you mean it with all your heart, just raise your hand. If you have never done this before and you want to do it tonight, raise your hand. If you've done this before and you want to renew your commitment to Jesus, raise your hand. And let him know that you want to follow him all the way in life, in death, hereafter, and forever. You may let your hands go. Just want to say, as you wake up and be a part of this meeting again tonight, welcome to God's family. It's a good thing to be a part of God's family. He is still working miracles today. And he can change your life as he changed mine and so many others. And make it good, even though the devil might come after us. Remember. There is victory in Jesus. Amen. Now tonight, I want each one of you to pull out one of your cards. And there is something very special I want you to write on your card tonight. If you have decided to follow Jesus for the first time, Write it on your card. If you have made a recommitment to Jesus, write it on your card. I want to know so that I can pray for you. If you have fallen back and you are ready to come back and do what he is asking of you, write that. And when you are done, I'm going to ask our uh, row personnel to come by and change your card for tonight's written material. So take a moment and write down what you are doing with Jesus tonight. Thank you, David. You can uh, come around, and when David passes, uh, exchange your card for tonight's material, and remember to put something on there that will indicate to me how I can pray for you. Thank you for being here. Remember, tomorrow night, not here. Uh, and... If you come, that's okay. 
but don't expect me to be here, okay? <laughs> and if you then come for each evening of the weekend, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, there's a book that you can get. And don't, don't, don't forget that on Saturday morning, according to the example of Jesus, we will also be here and we will talk about the battle for the mind. Tomorrow, uh, tomorrow night, nothing. But on Friday night, our topic will be water and blood. The battle for the mind on Saturday morning and then on Saturday evening. We've talked about the Antichrist, but you know that the Antichrist also has a mark. So what is the mark of the beast? If you wanted to know, or you have somebody that needs to know, we will be doing what we do here at Revelation today. Scripture with Scripture and find out what the mark of the beast would be. Cookies and tea in the foyer. Thank you for being here tonight and until Friday night, same time, same place. We'll see you then by God's grace. God bless you.